Welcome to the Barcelona Podcast, episode 163, and this opinion is brought to you by the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. I'm Dan Hilton, and I am happy to welcome back Zach Lowy to the show. Zach, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me back. It's great to be uh, back on the podcast and looking forward to discussing our topics for today. Well, today we are talking a number of things, youth football, evaluating talent, and much more. It's a little bit deviant of just talking about FC Barcelona the entire time. If you want some of that, you can go to the Patreon page, you can go to our YouTube channel, the Barcelona Podcast, and uh, there's a guarantee early next week that we'll be right back to Frances and I talking only about FC Barcelona. We're going to get to them at the end, but first we're going to be again talking about some talent evaluation, some uh, youth products, things like that. So, Zach, people may know you from maybe not just the last time you were on our show about just a year ago, a little bit more, but they might know you from your work on Breaking the Lines, but more Mm -hmm. likely they might also know you from your Twitter profile that has grown quite an audience for your persistence in shining a light on young talents in world football, particularly in Europe. So the question I want to start with from you that people seem to be following you for, how do you choose what you watch from week to week? (laughs) That's That's a really good question. I mean, I honestly look at, I tend to look at the uh, lineups before making a decision because there's just so many great games out there that aren't necessarily the the biggest teams, but that, you know, feature the the best talent. Like, for example, for today's games, I believe it's Mallorca against Osasuna and, um, but I, I will probably just look at the two lineups and or the four lineups and look at what sounds more enticing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for example, if there's a game between, um, I don't know, Toulouse and Strasbourg, and Strasbourg, then that are featuring some very good talents, I might choose that over, for example, an Arsenal uh, against Chelsea match, you know? Right. It, it, I, I mean, it depends on really what looks more appetizing, but... Thanks to this, um, you know, the, the the world that we live in today, we can watch multiple things at the same time as well as uh, watch games that we missed uh, later on, whether that be on the TV or on the computer and on a multitude of devices. So definitely one of the perks of, you know, living in today's internet-heavy uh, society. Yeah, and it is certainly something to be said about looking at rosters and seeing our squads and seeing that I know those are all, all known commodities and then finding other games and other teams and other squads where there are players certainly on the up and up. And it is simple. There, there seems to be a network there of you know about football talents when they're 16, 17, 18 years old and you just wind up keeping tabs on them. And uh, I would I would probably say, Zach, you don't have a master list somewhere where you're just adding these these uh, talented teenagers usually and then early 20-somethings. But the reason why I even mentioned that, and I'm glad you mentioned Toulouse and Strasbourg, because I do want to bring up the fact that it's no secret that France won the World Cup in 2018, and it's no secret that Barcelona also gets called France-Alona uh, recently because of that French contingent that does consist of Griezmann and Umtiti and Dembele and Tadibo. And it seems like every day there's another player, maybe not just from Ligue 1, but that is particularly French that's linked to Barcelona. And French football in particular, Zach, is just producing so many high-level talents. And I just want to give you a little list. Here's players without a France full national team cap at the moment, and that's Bupakari Sumare that you've mentioned before, along with Jonathan Bamba, and they both play at Lille. We've got William Saliba on loan from Arsenal, plays for St. Etienne. We've already seen him in last year's Champions League. That's Usam Oar and Jeff uh, Rene Adelaide. They both play for Lyon. Bubakar Kamara plays for Marseille. And then there's a contingent at RB Leipzig in Germany, and that is Ibrahima Kanate and Dajord Apamecano. And then Jules Kunde, actually from Bordeaux, made the move to Sevilla. And again, that's just a list of young players, basically from the ages of 18 to 23, who all have either moved on from their club in France just one step or they're still uh, waiting for that one big move. But those are all players that have yet to receive a national team call-up. And again, you and I, both Americans, I'm looking at that list and I say pretty much everybody on that list would already be a full national for the United States men's national team. And and certainly, and probably a starter too. Right. I mean, it's, it's definitely telling. I think that every single player you mentioned on that list has 
potential to be a dual national or is a dual national mm -hmm. and could play for, you know, an African country of their ancestry. And it's telling that they would rather fight it out for like a few call ups to Les Blues than uh, become a starter for, for that, that team, you know. I mean, it's really just a perfect storm right now in French football. I mean, looking at just the quality of players produced at pretty much every single position, um, I mean, they're really, it's, it's hard to think of any real weak spots in just what they're producing. I mean, you'll see... I don't know, you'll, you'll, you'll tend to see countries like, I don't know, Italy isn't really known for producing fullbacks. Spain isn't really known for producing strikers, at least in the uh, past, like, five years or so. France, on the other hand, they're pretty much producing talent at every single position, and it really speaks to what they've achieved as a footballing nation. I mean, they are, they are numero uno. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, a huge credit also goes to the uh, Claire Fontaine Football Center in France that does, I'd say, the best in the world at evaluating talent around Paris and the suburbs of Paris. Uh, and then when you talk about Mbappe, Dembele, um, TT, there, there are just so many players that have been identified around that region. Pogba, another one of those, uh, that made up the team that won in 2018 uh, and they continue to churn out talents over talents over talents over talents and Barcelona uh, merely trying to get I, I'd say almost ahead of the curve but a lot of their French players uh, were already established as well when they came to Barcelona but I think for the case of Sam Titi, who came from Lyon that was a perfect example that Ligue 1 is not considered a one of the top four leagues it is merely a top five league it is uh, I think far and away as people agree it to be the lowest of the fifth and that's simply due to the way that PSG completely runs away from it and the disparity there is uh, in, in funds to Ligue 1. Uh, but all that said, that's why Sam TT and same thing with Jean-Claude Dutibo, who had played 10 games for Toulouse before coming to Barcelona, they were largely unknown commodities and, and names that really did come out of nowhere before they make their first team to Barcelona. And I'd say that's a good thing. But as we're saying, it is getting harder and harder, I think, for Barcelona to then be uh, sniping good talent from Ligue 1 simply because of the, the high-profile players that keep coming out of there. Uh, and I, I just wonder about that, uh, where the rubber meets the road there, where how long it's going to take to be watching. But as we continue to talk about other leagues, Zach, I, I want to ask them the question that we've been talking about. Ligue 1, people say, is the fifth best in the, in, in the world. But... How do you judge leagues against each other when you're watching in terms of, of talent? Uh, and I, I want to mention in our closed Facebook group, uh, we, we had a conversation about this, and credit to all those involved. Uh, every time I even mention or people mention MLS players, it seems like playing in certain leagues disqualifies players. And what I mean here is that the example, Carlos Vela had 38 goals and 12 assists this year in MLS, and Joseph Martinez of Atlanta United had 33 and 3 in MLS. So Carlos Vela, who came from Real Sociedad, 38 and 12. Uh, he, he's still under the age of 30. You look at who Barcelona was linked to this week, and it's Lille's 20-year-old Nigerian forward, Victor Asiman, who has scored eight goals and two assists, 14 games so far this year. But if uh, Asiman likely slows down and finishes with, say, about 20 goals, which is what he would expect it to be, matching his total in the Jupiler League last year, why do we discard certain leagues completely when a seaman is going to get you know, less goals, and we just consider that that 10 extra goals and obviously uh, 10 years separating those players uh, would be the big difference between Vela, Martinez, and uh, Asimin. Yeah, I mean, you do have to, you can't just write off a player just because they play in a lower league. Um, and But you also have to look at the opposition. I mean, I've been watching the MLS playoffs this season, and I mean, really, there's... A lot of um, it's frustrating how many teams just completely ignore uh, d uh, defensive talent or just ignore the defensive side of building a team. You know, I mean, looking at probably the two favorites uh, to get to the final, LAFC and Atlanta United, both of them uh, collapsed this week, and part of that was just due to you know poor defending. Poor defending from Atlanta for Nick DeLeon's goal last night, as well as just just poor defensive performances all around from LAFC against both the Galaxy and Seattle. So that's definitely one of the factors. I mean, all credit goes to Joseph and Vela 
for putting in those kinds of performances. But uh, I think that even if Osimhen scores fewer goals than both those this, both those players this season, I think it would still be probably more impressive just because you have to look at the quality of the defenders uh, Osimhen is going uh, going against. And also, I mean, he has scored for Nigeria too, so he's not just, you know, he's not just scoring for a club. But yeah, I mean, and, and especially Ligun, which is a very physical and sometimes dirty league even, you know, you, get, you can get a lot of old, strong uh, heads in, in at, at center back who, you know, can put some, play some dirty tricks against you. It's, it's definitely a credit to OC men for not just scoring, but really taking um, this Lille team a bit, basically by, by the scruff of his neck. You know, they've, they've definitely struggled at times. I've watched them a lot this season, but and and it's it's natural to study. It's natural to struggle when you lose players such as Thiago Mendes and um, and Nicolas Pepe. So I definitely think it's a credit to OC men for uh, taking Lille to where they currently are right now. Yeah, and if you could give again, uh, Kool Aid's listening to this. What kind of number nine is OC men? One thing that definitely stands out to me whenever I watch Osimhen is just his movement. You know, he really knows how to um, to separate from defenders. And I've seen a lot of games where, uh, you know, he scored one or two goals, but he could have easily had uh, four goals had his finishing been better. So he'll, his finishing will definitely improve uh, considering he's only... 21 years old, but yeah, I really do think that he is uh, gradually becoming a, a complete center forward, you know, who can play with his back to goal, who's, who's um, you know, dominant aer- aerially. Uh, we saw in the Chelsea game, he scored against, I think that was taking advantage of an error from Kurt Zuma, and, and him just, you know, getting, grabbing that goal. Or maybe it was Tamori, I'm not sure. But um, Osimhen, I mean, obviously you have to take take uh, players like him with a grain of salt, considering the fact that he's and only been playing in a top five league for a few months. I mean, just looking at the initial struggles of Luka Jovic, who actually had a, a fantastic season for a top f- in a in a top five league as well as the Europa League with Eintracht Frankfurt last season, and he struggled to make the step up to Real Madrid early on in his career. So I would just say that uh, it is important to have patience, and when uh, Osimhen does get that big move uh, sooner or later, whether that's, I don't know, Chelsea, United, Barcelona, just important to, you know, give him patience. But yeah, I mean, Osimhen, definitely been one of my favorite players Recently, I, I really I, I did project him for stardom uh, last summer when right when Charleroi were about to sell him to Lille. Um, I mean, just looking at his story, it's pretty impressive. You know, he he uh, scored ten goals in the 2015 U17 World Cup and uh, won that for Nigeria. He um, then he got a move to Wolfsburg. Didn't really play much because. Wolfsburg were uh, in a lot of relegation fights, so they will obviously, you know, prefer experienced players as well as just very injury prone. In fact, last summer he had in summer of 2018 he had a few trials with, I think it was Anderlecht and Zultwargem, if I'm correct, um, and he was rejected by both of those because his body was so weak from malaria. But then he tried out a few months later for perhaps a lesser club in the Belgian tier, um, which was Charleroi, and he went there on loan, but with Charleroi retaining a option to buy, I believe. And um, yeah, he was he was incredible there, and and he really now he's he's setting the world alight at uh, Lille, and I'm very proud of him. So I think, yeah, you really got into the nitty-gritty of why Asiman is a player to watch. And again, he was linked to Barcelona this week. Uh, that coming from sport. And it is, 
always telling is I always mention to everybody that when you hear news coming mid, uh, we'll say when the action is going on and not necessarily just in those international windows or transfer windows, uh, I always put a little more credence in there. Uh, but again, when it's just a one-off story that just one publication is reporting on, such as this one with sport, then you also side-eye it just a little bit and you wonder if some agent or publicity is involved. But let's talk about some youth products for Barcelona on the other side of the ad break. Now, back from that break, Zach, we have to give a special happy birthday here on the podcast to Ansu Fadi. He is 17 today, uh, 17, uh, that being he's an old veteran, savvy uh, player now on FC Barcelona's first team. I would ask you, where do you stand on the age of players and letting them play at the top level? In me, speaking of the fact that Ansu Fadi against Real Valle to lead, I, I think every match this season, whether it was uh, uh, particularly against Osasuna, obviously, when he broke onto the scene, he can take a lot more physical punishment than pretty much every other 16, or in particular, I'd say, uh, you look at a Sergio Roberto, what he could have done at 16, it's just a different story here, uh, just physically. So do you believe in that old adage of if he's if he's good enough, then he's old enough? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely do. I mean, I would perhaps caution against overplaying players from a young age because it is important to... Uh, give them time to recover, especially I think that there was one game during the season where Ansu Fati was not included in the squad because he, had, he was literally having growing pains, mm-hmm. just tells you how, you know, how young he is. But yeah, no, I, I definitely do believe in that adage. And I think that 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 it's important to to, you know, give your own youngsters a shot. I think that Looking at a lot of the stories, not just in La Liga, but in the Premier League, you know, we're seeing uh, one of the few bright spots of Manchester United season have been Aaron Juan Bis- or two of them have been Scott McTominay and Aaron Juan Bissaka. Uh, McTominay was sort of um, an undervalued youth player who eventually uh, got a chance and then won his way into the starting lineup. Juan Bissaka, on the other hand, you know, he was he wanted to go out on loan because he wasn't getting enough playing time at Crystal Palace. Um, I believe he was like third or fourth choice right back there. Then a few injuries came up and he, he suddenly, you know, shows the world that he's incredible and, and wins a starting spot in the heart of the Palace lineup and then gets a big move to Manchester United. Um, as well as Chelsea, you know, looking at this really feel-good uh, Chelsea team, with so many academy prospects who are academy made prospects who are finally you know proving their worth T- Tammy Abraham, Fikayo Tamori, uh, Mason Mount it's definitely not just a win for young players but a win for the fans as well who uh, get the extra reward of seeing uh, the players who've you know worked so hard to push themselves up through the academy and to get into the first team picture, um, being rewarded with starts. But yeah, I mean, as for Ansu, it, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to see him carve out a name for himself in Barcelona. Still definitely needs to improve before he can be trusted to you know, be a starter at the club, as, as we saw this week. But the signs are definitely there. And just looking at him I mean I really just love uh I love the look of him you know just his ability to just take on players really just his fearlessness and his confidence that tells me that you know he's going to be a player and if if and if not at Barcelona which you know I hope he does become a key player at Barcelona if not there then somewhere else he's clearly got a lot of talent well, it's funny you actually mentioned Chelsea back then because Chelsea, they are playing all their youth when it's obviously Abraham coming back on from loan. It's Mason Mount coming from uh, Derby County. We played with uh, Frank Lampard and, and the rest. But a lot of that is begot because of that transfer ban that they had. Now, Barcelona's transfer ban back in the day, things worked out a little differently because prior to it, they did 
go out and they made plenty of signings, Mark andre Ter Stegen and Luis Suarez, and they reinforced their squad where the use still was not completely necessary, even when dealing with that transfer ban. And the reason I mention that is because, again, we're praising now Chelsea because they're basically being punished into, uh, I don't know, what, what we like to think of doing the right thing and blooding yourself, your squad, through your youth. Uh, so I, I would say now, shifting things just a bit, Ansu Fadi coming from La Masia, and uh, I, I want to also plug here the YouTube Video from it this week is all about the Barcelona B players that I think who could be next up breaking into the first team. Uh, Ansu Fadi already on that list. Carlos Perez already on that list. And Ricky Puj we know about. But with La Masia, there's so many players who don't break through. And those are the ones I, I want to highlight just quick. Not the ones who are, are who have left the club that you can now see at different places, whether it's uh, uh, Robert Navarro, who's playing at the U-17 World Cup. He's at Real Sociedad in their B team. or Just a ton of different players. Same thing with Pablo Moreno, who then moved to Juventus. I'm not talking about those guys. But while La Masia aren't regularly cracking the first team at Barcelona recently, uh, I think this year, you know, being the pleasant surprise I talked about with Fati. Do you think prospects at major academies then have a leg up, though, when looking for first-team football elsewhere? And I think the the second part of that is how long does that name cachet sustain them? No, they, they definitely do. I mean, I've said for a while that, especially back in the U20 World Cup this summer, that a lot of players who you know were coming up through Barcelona or Ajax or Benfica's academies, you know, some of the most storied academies in Europe, were outshone, uh, were you know outshone and outplayed by a lot of players who, you know, if you showed their current club or current academy to a a diehard football fan, I'm sure that they wouldn't even know uh, where or what that that team was. So yeah, I mean, it definitely does uh, give you an advantage. It's definitely a privilege that a lot of uh, players are unable to afford. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it also is interesting to see the, the, the certain types of players who have diverged off that path. For example, Dani Olmo left uh, La Masia, uh, which is, you know, probably considered the best, if not one of the best academies in the world, uh, to get regular playing time at Dynamo Zagreb. And this was while he was still a teenager and still far, far away from either uh, club's first team picture. But he left that because he knew that his path to the first team would be a lot easier at Zagreb than Barcelona. And he was right. I mean, look at him right now. He, you know, playing regularly in the Europa League last season, playing regularly in the Champions League this season, doing very well. Um, might even get to the knockout rounds. Also did very well at the U21 Euros. Yeah, Spain's, Spain's best and, player, to my to my count. I think he was Spain's best player there, and I think of all that squad there, the U21s, he's the one that's most breaking in. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Denny Almo because he went from a player that Barcelona probably should have swung forward to buy back. But again, where was his playing time going to come from? And now we're at a point where I think he's he's going to be going leaving uh, Dinamo Zagreb for somewhere in the the range of, what, 40 to 65 million euro, certainly. Uh, definitely. I mean, the, I believe Zagreb rejected offers of 40 million last summer. Right. Yep. If I'm saying so, I mean, I think that, I mean, now, I mean, yeah, 50 million, I think, would probably be the going rate uh, if he continues at this rate. Especially, I mean, Spain don't have as that many great wingers or just wide players in general. So I really would not uh, even write off a a trip to the Euros for him. Yes, it's definitely a long shot, but I would say he, he has a chance. Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and Danny Almo is one of those that I, I think made the most of moving away early on, and, and so many haven't. But as I mentioned about how long that, that name cachet sustains him, I think of Real Valladolid in that match, and Sandra Ramirez nowhere to be seen, obviously, after making that move to Everton doesn't doesn't wind up working out. I think of Patrice, who played for Lazio, and Adama Traore for Wolverhampton, Rodrigo Tarin for Leganes, Wilfred Captum from Real Batiste, and I think some of those names... Uh, 
Tarina and Triora are a little different, but I think for the likes of Sandro or, or Captum, if they're not linked to La Masia, and if that's not where they're from, I don't know how much longer they would have been in rotation just due to never being able to break in. So that's the other side of the coin, because the counter-argument is it's, that eventually players will need first-team minutes. Yeah. No, it is. It, it's, also, it's almost like... Uh, like in in America, you know, if you have a degree from Harvard or Yale, that will just always get your foot in the door, you know. But there are a lot of uh, people who went to, I don't know, lesser schools because they felt that education would be better for them and it ended up paying off. And that's sort of, I think that's maybe the uh, academic equivalent of what Danny Olmo did, you know. So I, that's sort of the way I see it almost, you know, looking at big name colleges versus big name uh, academies, you know, definitely has its benefits in, in getting your name in the door and getting you uh, these big moves. But if you, can, if you can make a name for yourself or make a career for yourself outside of that and in, in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere that works for you, I mean, go for it. Yeah, I agree with that. And now, switching gears for one final time, it's time to talk about Barcelona. Uh, again, here we are on the Barcelona podcast, 27 minutes in. We're just getting to FC Barcelona. But uh, <laughs> one of the reasons for that is, again, when we're looking at youth products and things like that in the world, other than I think this year's actually been one of the better years for Valverde being able to sidestep that criticism. Uh, again, bringing up Fati, and we've seen a little bit of Perez. And it seems like there are others knocking on the door, people still calling for Puj, obviously, the big omission. However, the criticism now, because there is La Masia starting to break in a little bit, Valverde and his playing time for the third straight season, it, to me, it felt like they were going to be pressing a little bit more. The inclusion of De Young was going to change things up, and I think it has a, a bit. And Real by the lead, I was uh, pleasantly surprised at the tactics more so than I was uh, in midweek, the prior week against Slavia Prague. But as an outsider, Zach, where do you sit on the criticism of Valverde and that playing style? Do you find that when you do tune into Barca, that it's more boring than you're used to, and you think that it just doesn't? Do you find do you find as an outsider that they've lost the identity that you enjoy to watch? No, I mean, I think that losing identity is is sort of. Um, I don't think that the coach determines a club's identity, in my opinion. Identity is so much more than just a playing style or how how a team is operating. I mean, you know, when people talk about losing identity, I mean, it's just sort of vague. I mean, look at look at the best football that Barcelona played under Valverde, right? It was it was pretty much uh, a four four two or or a four four two diamond with Paulinho at the tip of midfield and with Messi and Suarez up top. It wasn't a 4-3-3, which is, you know, generally considered the identity of Barcelona. I would even argue that um, Barcelona have probably have looked a lot better at times with a 4-2-3-1 with almost with with Vidal pretty much operating at the tip of midfield. So, I mean, if you're if you're suggesting that Barcelona have lost their identity. I mean, you have to wonder: is that because they're not playing the four three three, or because they're not playing beautifully? I mean, it's it's really subjective. I personally thought that Valverde should have stepped down at the end of last season, but he didn't. So, you know, what I I don't get what uh, asking Valverde to step down or or what abusing him and Rakitic over the internet is going to do for Barcelona. I mean, personally, if, if you're a Barcelona fan, I don't think you should be doing that. But I do understand the criticisms of his style and of his tactics. I just wish that people would be fair to him and, and give him the credit that he deserves when he does get it right. Like in the Inter game where he completely got not only his substitutions but his tactical changes right, I mean, Inter have been one of the best teams in Europe this season. Uh, Conte, Antonio Conte, of course, one of the best managers in football. And Valverde brought home all three points. So I just think you need to you know, put the agenda to the side and look at 
is it Valverde? Is, is Valverde the sole reason why Barcelona are underperforming, or is it you know a number of things? And just just to put it out there, Barcelona have currently have the longest winning streak in Europe's top five league. So you know it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah, it, it's certainly not. But the thing that it's a chicken. It's chicken or the egg when it comes to Valverde and credit because uh, obviously, and Sid Lowe had a great, uh, great quote about this uh, on ESPN FC uh, yesterday, and I, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said there's going to come a day when Messi's going to pass and score on his own to himself because Messi has been uh, magical is the understatement, uh, and he's and obviously when Barcelona are flying high and doing well, Messi's getting a lot of the credit. But I think the stats don't lie, and you know we've used WhoScored.com in the past, and I just want to since Messi returned to action, we'll say the full 90-minute fitness. And that, as you mentioned, was the Inter game. His right. who scored rating, 9.1 that day. Against Sevilla, that 4 nothing win, 9.1. Against Ibar, 3 nothing win, 8.6. Against Slavia Prague, a 9.3 for Messi. And then a perfect 10 against Real Valle to lead after the two goals and two assists. So in those five games that you could say Messi has been back to full fitness this season... It's no surprise that Barcelona have not only turned around their form, but with the exception of, I think, that Slavia Prague match. And again, Inter was a, a tough side against a top team in Serie A, as I mentioned back then. But uh, with the exception, again, of against Slavia Prague, where it just things weren't, weren't working. And I did mention tactically on last week's show and the Patreon that when Messi drops so deep in the middle of that 4-3-3 and pulls out from the wing, again, dropping basically in the midfield to get the ball. It just tightens everything up. It pushes De Jong and Arter out to the wings or whoever the other, uh, whether it's Vidal. And against Real, Real Valle, the lead, you can listen to the Patreon for the full thing, but I thought it was quite different because Messi did stay farther up the pitch and he allowed the midfield to do what they do. And when you allow, that being the midfield three of Busquets and Vidal, Vidal is both running forward, as you mentioned, at basically at the top of that midfield, and in the same way, he's tracking back and he's working hard. And when you have a third midfielder alongside Busquets and De Young, who has that kind of work rate, De Young is able to dribble into that open space and move the ball forward and shuffle between defense and attack. And it's not just Messi who has to pick it up from PK and then take it 40 yards, lose the ball or something like that. And I also, again, in that match, I mentioned that Fati, just the existence of a winger, Fati, or whether it was Dembele, for all the criticism of Dembele, the width he adds, it's just being a, simply being a winger. We've seen the same thing with Carlos Perez on the right wing when he's just adding width. And that does something to 4-3-3, opens things up. I don't, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not that is a tactical adjustment that Valverde is making or simply it's, they're taking what the opponent is giving them. And Messi, against a team like Real Valladolid, didn't have to drop as deep as he did against a team that in Slavia Prague that was a little more defensively sound. The, the importance of just width in any team cannot be understated. And it, it doesn't even matter if you have, uh, if you're playing a, like a 4-2 four, four diamond with no wingers or, or a 3-5-2, which is the case uh, at Inter. You have to have some sort of width, uh, whether that comes from the midfielders, the strikers, the fullbacks, you know, what what have you. And that's partially why... Jordi Alba was so crucial and so efficient over the first two seasons of uh, Ernesto Valverde's reign because he was really so just so effective and so necessary when it came to adding width. But yeah, no, absolutely. I believe that um, that that's one of the main reasons why the Messi, Suarez, Griezmann trio has not really clicked just because there's no real width in that side you know all of those players they sort of uh want to you know come for the ball and well you know at, at least Messi and Griezmann you know they want to be on the ball they're not going to be making those runs in behind or you know stretching the defense and that's that's partially why uh, I believe Valverde has given so much playing time to uh, Ansu and even Carlos Perez this season, um, because it's so important to have players who know how to stretch the the opposition and and create that extra space for the teammates. I, I do think that Usmane is very good in that particular facet, but he does certainly need to improve in other areas of the game to just become a complete 
player. I mean, I don't, I don't think that Usmane, he, he's not, he's not a bad player, and I think he, he's a good player, and I don't think he's necessarily even been a flop at Barcelona, but he's just still kind of lacking a lot of basic, uh, not not basic, but really fundamental aspects of any player who who's willing to become a starter at Barcelona, whether that be not not necessarily picking the easy pass, but instead going for the daring uh, through ball, uh, perhaps that you know combining with the teammates and and just trying to make something with your off the ball runs, you know, little little areas of the game which uh, I don't think Usmani was necessarily trained on, but that he ones that he certainly needs to uh, learn and adjust to to become a key player at Barcelona. Yeah, there are things that need to change at individually with certain players, Dembele being a big one. And for the likes of Griezmann, as you mentioned, with being the issue, uh, I always mention that two of my favorites of all time, I think they do get, uh, their time at Barca gets a little overrated where they were better everywhere else they were because they had more of a leading role. But when you see David Villa and Terry Henry and we'll say the right. back seat they took at Barcelona, it was selfless for them. And uh, if I'm Antoine Griezmann, as much as I wouldn't like it, I chose to come to Barcelona, and so I'm watching tape of what Villa and and Henri did. And uh, Henri, I loved in that documentary, Take the Ball, Pass the Ball, mentions that, and this is a lot to do with Guardiola's coaching, was that he just drilled that run from Henri and, v- and Villa behind the defense. They drilled it over and over and over and over again until it came to fruition. Uh, and again, another criticism for Valverde is just with the stars, and it's a different team as well, where their best players at that time were 26, 27, and a little more malleable at the time. But now you've got players that are over the age of 30, and I think this has always been un- unfortunate for Valverde that the time in which he took over Barcelona, he was uh, he is basically a, ma- a team manager as as much as he is a teacher and somebody that's going to be trying to make the team into his own image. He is simply facilitating a system that he believes is going to accurately work for his 30-plus-year-old stars. Uh, and I think you know that's one of the big issues that's happened, that he, he's unable to really mold the team because these players are so established and they are what they are. So the big question comes, uh, obviously, Suarez and Messi, PK, uh, Busquets, they are the players that they are going to be, and they are all-time great, certainly. Uh, but when it comes to Griezmann, who's... At this point in his late 20s, he's nearing 30. Can he change his game at this point in the ways that we saw Henri and Villa do? And I think that's what helps make them all-time greats. And in the same regard, Dembele, still in his early 20s, and I don't know how much longer I'm going to be getting away on the show with saying that he's mm-hmm. still just a young French football player, which almost brings us full circle, Zach, back to sure. back to France, back to the fact that they produce so many young talents and uh, Ousmane Dembele coming up at the perfect time to win a World Cup. But, Zach, you've written about that and talked about all of uh, particularly French football uh, but a lot of different places. Again, it's not just Ligue 1. We, you spouted knowledge here about the Belgian League, about the French League. You mentioned the U17 World Cup where Barcelona fans can see Jose Martinez as well as Es Maribo who's uh, been waiting on the bench for his shot as well as the starring role for Spain in that 0-0 against Argentina was Pedri who Barcelona will know. Uh, he's supposed to be with Barca B next year coming over from Las Palmas but uh, the way that he's played so far I think he's going to be knocking into the first team as well but you can only have so many players there uh, Zach and the podcast can only have uh, so much time so we cut our time here uh, comes to an end but I would ask you Zach before you leave where can people find your work yeah you can find me at uh, Zach Lowy at Zach Lowy on Twitter Z-A-C-H-L-O-W-Y as well as on breakinglines.com uh, our Twitter account BTL vid and on various other uh, news outlets well, Zach, I do appreciate you for giving the t- giving your time and providing us with all those fun nuggets today. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me on, Dan. Appreciate it. And thanks so much to you for tuning in. You can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe. You can find us on social media, too. We're on Twitter, at the Barcelona Pod, or at Hilton D13 for me, and on Instagram, at the Barcelona Pod. Our closed Facebook group is tvpod.link backslash group for deeper dive and discussions, and you can help us out on Patreon to continue making these shows at tvpod.link backslash Patreon. We're also on YouTube now, as I mentioned in the show, 
at the Barcelona podcast, where this week we talked all about Barcelona B after last week talking about Ricky Poo. So we've got some young stuff there from the last few weeks, but uh, a lot of different goodies. Check out that on the Barcelona podcast YouTube channel. Check us out there. Hit that subscription button. And thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And for the Barca.